I grew up in Pakistan. My family and I lived in a city called Peshawar. I remember it as a crowded border city, and it was often referred to as a refugee city due to the influx of refugees from Afghanistan. Extreme poverty and overcrowded refugee camps were a part of everyday life. I'm often asked what it was like to grow up there, but I'm never really sure how to answer because Peshawar was my home. It's where my friends were, and it was my normal. And perhaps in some ways, my experiences weren't that different from many of yours. We still had pinatas at birthday parties. There were numerous shopping trips. And some of our dads even organized a foreign kid soccer club. Here I am several years earlier with a family friend and their water buffalo. Probably seems a little random, but uh, let me try and explain. In many countries, having a water buffalo can be a game changer. These animals provide a source of nutrition and often improve economic stability of the family. Because of this, many cultures view these animals as a symbol of the family's stability and status in the community. So, if the water buffalo are this important, what happens to the family when they get sick? Can you imagine if your family's future was directly tied to the health of an animal? This is a really scary concept for those of us who have trouble keeping a goldfish alive. <laughs> well, eventually my family decided to move back to the US and I had to leave the water buffalo behind. We landed in Austin, Texas, what would be our new home. And that's when the culture shock really set in. For years after returning to the States, I found myself struggling to reconcile the disparities between life as I knew it in Peshawar and life in Austin. Eventually, I recognized that this unique perspective, the one that had so often isolated me from peers in the US, was actually an incredible asset in disguise. Ever since I can remember, I've wanted to somehow help balance this disparity between life for us in the West and life in the third world. And from this goal grew the inspiration to pursue a graduate degree focusing on improving vaccines. With a good vaccine, our bodies are equipped to generate an immune defense so that if we're ever exposed to the disease-causing pathogen, we'll be protected and able to bypass getting sick. Seems simple enough. We get the vaccine, we don't get sick. But what about all the diseases that we don't yet have a vaccine for? or the vaccines that are really only effective in a certain population. And did you know that many vaccines need to be kept cold in order for them to remain effective? This is referred to as the cold chain and can be extremely challenging in some parts of the world. Many of the challenges associated with vaccines will require us to work together to address them. And I don't mean just as scientists. One of the major challenges that we're facing is improving global access to vaccines. Here in the States, getting the vaccines that we need is pretty easy. But in many parts of the world, simply transporting the vaccines from one place to the local hospital or refugee camp can be a daunting task. Some of the challenges that our lab focuses on are improving vaccine stability 
and efficacy. My research involves a new method to deliver vaccines, which has the potential to improve both human and veterinary vaccines. We're calling it VAXIM, which stands for Vaccine Self-Assembling Immune Matrix. Now, VAXIM in itself is not a type of vaccine, but rather it's a unique way to deliver that vaccine. Imagine that Vaxim is like this treat dispensing ball, and the vaccine components are like the treats inside. Before injection, Vaxim is a semi-viscous liquid, kind of like this syrup, only less sticky. And in this state, it's easily combined with various components of your vaccine. Immediately after injection, Vaxim takes on more of a jello-like consistency, encapsulating the vaccine and leading to the formation of a vaccine depot. We hypothesize that the formation of this temporary depot allows the vaccine to be released more slowly over time, and this gives our immune cells more opportunities to interact with the vaccine components. And this leads to a bigger, badder immune response should we ever come into contact with the pathogen. In this experiment, we vaccinated mice against the flu, either with or without vaccine. Then we exposed both groups of mice to live influenza virus. And you can see here that by adding Vaxim, we were able to improve protection from 87.5% to 100% protection. Now, in addition to the research that's being done here at UGA, we're also involved in three vaccine trials currently underway in China and the Philippines. In these trials, we're vaccinating water buffalo, with a candidate vaccine against a parasite-induced disease called schistosomiasis. Now, a schisto-infected water buffalo would display symptoms like a wasting disease. Humans are also susceptible to infection, and there's currently no effective vaccine. The World Health Organization and the CDC both consider schistosomiasis to be the most important parasitic infection in terms of public health and economic impact, second only to malaria. And yes, my life just took a full circle back to water buffalo. I've seen firsthand that sometimes a promising future is mutually dependent on having a healthy water buffalo. And by providing access to more effective vaccines, we can improve quality of life on a global scale, regardless of the country that you call home. Thank you.